everybody. Good morning. And uh, you know, there are certain chapters that you read because you have to answer questions in your question pay answer, you know, exams. So first, when you think about gut brain access, I'm sure most of you would be thinking about that. But it's a theoretical aspect. It's not going to. There are other things that you read for the clinical part, and this is like a theory answer that I have to write a 10 mark answer. So. That was our concept till some time back, you know, the gut-brain axis, it exists far away in research, not in practice. But today where we stand, there is, and thanks to the organizers who made us read so much about gut-brain <laughs> axis, so today we are a lot wiser than we were three days back. But yes, um, clinically speaking, gut-brain axis has come a long way forward. So today when we're talking about gut-brain axis, it's not something that is theoretical, it's something that we are practicing. And, the, and we really need to talk more about this so that we understand it better. We realize where it impacts our you know, patients, what can we do to help them, where is it that we are missing out on maybe on the gut-brain axis because we are not talking about it. So uh, it's, it's great to hear ma'am you know, speak about the basic framework that we are going to discuss about. And I'm sure we're going to have an interesting conversation here. Hi, good morning everyone. I am Dr. Meenal, I come from Jaipur. And it's really wonderful listening to Dr. Vaishali ma'am and Dr. Ahmed Ima. So as ma'am said, we read only to answer. But at times we skip answers on choice also. One question pe choice pe chhodenge na, full marks nahi chahega. So this is one of those topics that we used to probably not very thorough with, the, with as ma'am rightly said. But at the same time, this topic is not new now. This topic has not only been picked up by endocrinologists or diabetologists, this topic has been very fondly picked up even by gastroenterologists. So gut-brain access is not something that only we are talking. Right from the newest, the latest concept of fecal capsules, the fecal implants, a fecal uh, oral fecal capsules available for various therapies, the concept of microbiomes, that has been becoming very popular and most of us are discussing. And going back to ages, if you remember your dadi nanis, dahi khana jaruri hota hai, dahi health ke bahut acha hota hai. Though they never knew that it's lactobacillus, but it is a positive microbiota. Now we know and now we understand that the knowledge was always there. Now we are probably doing it in a more structured manner. So the concept of gut-brain access, and it has got various aspects, so let's go through it. So Dr. Meenal, I, I have to start with uh, some compilation of questions for you. That How do you find it's linked with endocrine practice and how, where do you come across gut-brain linkage in your own practice and uh, uh, how do you explain the bidirectionality that uh, gut affecting the brain and the brain affecting the gut? Uh, do you have any experiences on this and would you like to elaborate? Ma'am, uh, yeah, of course, thank you. Uh, first of all, this answer will be off theory. So if the students are here, it, you can't quote it in your exams. But yes, gut is practically the largest endocrine organ nowadays. Though your theory will not mention that, you'll have to mention the specific uh, age-old glands of endocrinology. But actually speaking, gut is the largest endocrine gland. And as Madam has already told, we have got more than 12 varieties or 12 types of en entero endero endocrine cells, and they are producing more than 30 hormones. And the concept of incretin that we learned with GLP and the GIP and the GPP-4. So these are the enzymes and these are the hormones which we learned long back, almost parallel to insulin. If today we are in the centenary year for insulin, incretin concept is almost uh, equally old, almost 90 years old actually. So the endocrine hormones being secreted from the gut, we knew it since long. Now of course we have lot many number of hormones. Now we are talking of GLP-2 as Madam talked. We are talking of other hormones. But if you remember, we always knew secretin, ghrelin, uh, cholecystokinin, all these we already knew and we have been studying. So gut is actually a very large endocrine gland with a lot of hormones and the gut brain axis, the communication is bidirectional. Again, that is uh, a non-disputed and a non-debated topic. We all know the concept of mood and food. You are depressed, your food choices change. You are happy, your food choices change. Your stomach is upset, you are offered a different set of food. And if you are having a chocolate, your mood changes. Most of the time we are gifted chocolates. Why? Because through your gut, the signaling is to the brain. So what is it? It is basically a 
something called uh, reward therapy. We are using food as reward, most of us, because of the dopamine effect. So again, there is something called a bi-directional communication. You make your stomach, your GIT happy, your gut happy, and your brain signals as a happy mood. If you reach home very tired and the food is not to your taste, your anger doubles. So that is a bi-directional communication. And if you are very upset and you are given a very good food, so gut is the largest endocrine gland, off records again, but it is producing more than 30 hormones. And there are, besides hormone, there are uh, enteric plexuses, which are again neurochemical neurotransmitters, which are sending signals to the brain. And brain at the same time through its reward therapy, that I will probably uh, talk a little more if ma'am allows me, that how does it happen that one particular reward therapy, you're full, you're absolutely full, you can't even take a, a, another bite more. But at the same time, if you're offered sweets, or a chocolate, or something that you like, you are still able to consume it. How does that happen? Because the reward pathway that the brain has established over the period of years between your brain and gut, that supersedes your satiety center also. And that is why your favorite food makes its place. So there, is, there are real life experiences of your bi-directional communication. This is how, ma'am, the gut brain actually I think wonderfully is. explained. And uh, Arundhati, would you like to explain on how gut feelings are linked with emotion? So we say that it's my gut feeling that I should not do this. I so do you think that gut can really sense uh, what you feel or uh, both ways, like uh, Meedal Madam rightly mentioned? Uh, it so appears that the gut feeling that we were talking about is actually about the feelings of millions of bacteria inside the gut. So it's actually the bacteria who are feeling. And uh, it's, it's, it's very surprising to know that actually our gut has bacteria which weigh total, weight is about two kgs. So two kgs of bacteria everybody has, and it's not like, <laughs> you know, it's something that is actually defining a lot. So these bacteria that we have, these microflora that we have, if you're talking about this particular area, there are some good microflora, and there are some bad microflora. And I mean, all of us have both of them, but it is the percentage of the good or the bad, the ratio between the good and the bad, that's basically determining you know, what your uh, brain is sensing. So there have been very, very interesting uh, you know, studies which have been done, which have seen, which have looked into microflora in relation to depression, in relation to response to a certain situation, in relation to anxiety. Even uh, there have been studies with autistic behavior and microflora, very interesting studies. And there have been studies which have linked these, you know, for example, with cesarean section right from there, from the time of birth. So cesarean section vis-a-vis -vis a normal delivery. A normal delivery is where the child is getting exposed to the microflora earlier. And it has been seen that these children who are born of normal delivery have a better good is to bad ratio of microflora, have a lesser tendency of depression, of autistic mood dis disorders, they, they're, you know, their catching up power is easier, their memory is better. And today when we are talking of other neurological diseases, say we're talking about Parkinsonism, we're talking about uh, Alzheimer's, and very interestingly we're seeing connections between microflora and, and uh, you know, Parkinsonism. We're today we're talking of therapeutics in terms of microflora and Parkinson's. So uh, this response, this, this connection from uh, the brain to the axis, it's basically, so brain to the gut is basically about the CNS and it is the hypothalamic pituitary axis, right? And these act via hormones and other the neural signals at various levels of the gut. So it, it's the immune system, it's the muscle, it's the mucus, it's the motility, you know? And this microflora in turn says, okay, you are doing, you are affecting me via this, I'm also going to attack you via the same thing. So via the same signals, immune and you know, the, the permeability, the uh, movement of the muscles, they kind of affect the vagal signaling that goes back and tells the brain. And there are relations between this microflora and the hippocampal signals, the limbic system, you know, which decides on our emotion our behavior. So very interestingly, this gut feeling is actually something which exists very, very strongly. When you're talking of therapeutics today, you know, treatment of depression with probiotics. Now how would you possibly link that? But we are seeing 
po you know, positive connections when you're, you know, you're, so there is that link and we have to understand it better. We need better studies, we need more clinical studies to understand this connection better, but the gut feeling definitely exists. So I think it is real. It's not only Absolutely. a literary word. So no, gut feeling is a real feeling. Yes. And I think most of our colleagues also tell us that when I feel that my gut tells me I don't uh, do those things. So they are more instinctive in nature. Yes. And uh, Dr. Meenal, how does diabetes really affect uh, the gut in terms of complications? So where does it affect the enteric nervous system and how does it affect this motility and all these things? So what is the role of diabetes in causation of gut disorder? Paris's Diabeticorum. So that was my first paper actually. So that was the time when we learned that diabetes is uncontrolled, that the neuropathy part, the peripheral neuropathy affect, of course we all know the tingling, numbness and the fatigue, but the autonomic neuropathy, it affects your motility. So there is delayed gastric emptying, there is slowed gastric emptying, and most of the diabetic patients are constipated. So that is, or maybe not actually constipated, as Madam showed, motion say emotion par, they have a sensation of incomplete defecation. So probably that is how diabetes actually, hyperglycemia affects the motility, the GI motility, there's slow down motility, there's a sense of fullness always, there is a sense of abdominal distension always. So that is how one thing, then of course there can be alteration of behavior because such patients end up with a lot of laxatives, and that leads to, at times, loose motions, and further loose motions will hyper-exaggerate their constipation on the next other days. So there can be alteration of the GI motility behavior, but actually, most commonly that we come across is the decreased motility and sense of abdominal fullness. And another way diabetes affects is because of its uh, therapeutic interventions also. Metformin, if we talk of, is going to affect your GI if you introduce GLP-1 RA, then again, GI side effects are the most common. So the therapeutic interventions that we are making in diabetes are also going to affect the gut, and uncontrolled diabetes is also going to affect the gut. So these are the major effects that we find. Yeah, and uh, in addition, I think Meenal Madam made an important point that uh, medical therapy of diabetes itself is known to affect the gut flora. So a lot of the drugs that we use in diabetes also change the microbes. And that is how uh, abdominal pain can come as a symptom with just a uh, spasmodic pain. Visceral hypersensitivity is a very common phenomenon which, which is very commonly observed, which we do not appreciate clinically. We pro probably we are too busy to attend to that particular complaint, but most of the patients are always complaining of abdominal fullness, distension, and they have a, uh, a visceral hypersensitivity, which is again attributed to the enteric plexus neuropathy. So that is another way of thinking. Then Thank the you. microbiota, yeah. as Madam is uh, mentioning, yes, of course, we had, most of the patients are on some or the other multivitamin in their prescriptions. So the drugs, specifically metformin, is known to change your microbiome. And the probiotics, which we are adding to our patients in the form of multivitamins, again, that will alter the microbiota of the gut. So the end result will be absolutely undefined, unpredictable different for different patient, different for the same patient at different times, depending upon the uh, air, depending upon the region where the patient is, depending upon the ethnicity, depending upon unbelievable, but depending upon the way the, ch the patient was delivered, as Madam said. If a patient has been delivered by cesarean section, his microbiota will be different. A patient delivered by a vaginal delivery will have a different microbiota. So right from the birth history, the patient will have a different behavior. So, Dr. Arundhati, if diabetes is going to affect the gut so badly, uh, are there any ways to prevent that or uh, are there any therapeutic uh, uh, implications of this, using this knowledge of gut-brain access to help the gut? Well, ma'am, prevention is also, uh, apart from this uh, way in which diabetes affects the gut, I would also like to talk about the opposite thing, yeah. the, the gut microbes affecting diabetes. Sure. So because gut microbes are by themselves causing a state of inflammation that's affecting the permeability. We are talking about lipopolysaccharide, endomycel uh, inflammation, and all of that has been seen to have a detrimental effect 
per se on the blood glucose levels and the blood lipid levels. Mm. So uh, today when we understand about the treatment of diabetes in relation to the gut, if you're talking about it, first thing would be the diet. Because we have seen a strong association mm. with a certain kind of food with the gut microbes. For example, fatty food. A, a, a diet which is very high in fat content alters the gut microflora. That has been very strongly seen in a lot of studies. Mm. Also again, uh, the opposite way, Protein seems to have a beneficial effect up to a certain level. And very interestingly, actually, non-vegetarian proteins have a better, better effect. Risk. Better effect on the micro microbes. And we generally have a tendency to think that, you know, non-veg food is not that good. But in terms of gut microbes, they are better. Very interestingly also, we've seen magnesium. We generally de don't tend to talk about these things. But magnesium deficiency and gut microbes and diabetes has been seen to have an, you know, an, a vicious cycle going amongst itself. So these, which we know for, you know, in, in general about the treatment of diabetes, we wouldn't want a high fat food or we would want to keep the fiber there. So that has an implication on the gut axis that is there. Also the, uh, the pharmacotherapy that we were talking about, metformin and the others, they, apart from, I, I'm today stressing on the gut microbiota because the other aspects we know, we discussed that per se, metformin causes a, you know, GI discomfort. But it also has an effect on the, you know, gut microbiota. Today we are talking about alpha carbos, uh, uh, acarbos and yeah. voglibos. Yeah. So acarbos per se also has an effect on the gut microbiota, which is positive in nature. So that could also be there. A lot of times you see our patients come with uh, GI discomfort and if they're on metformin, we think it's metformin induced, we stop the metformin or decrease the dose, but it doesn't help them. It doesn't help them, they say, no, it's no better. So they go into a chemist, they're taking an antibiotic maybe for five days. That's further affecting the, you know, that's causing dysbiosis is the term. But it's mm -hmm. not a symbiosis, it's a dysbiosis now where the microbes and everything is altered. So the enteroendocrine axis is altered, the neural affluence are altered, the permeability is altered, the inflammation is altered. So it's, 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 it's an entire vicious circle. So when you're treating patients with diabetes in, and when we're thinking about it in terms of the gut, we need to keep a more holistic approach. You know, when we say, I have have a GI discomfort, take that, at times, achha, achha, okay, okay, fine. A PPI, it's, it's a commonest thing, what will a PPI do? I mean, it's just suppressing the acid. It's not taking care of anything else. It's not taking care of the dysmotility, the dysbiosis. So we have to keep a more holistic approach when we're thinking of the gut in terms of diabetes treatment. I think very well put that the thought needs to be more holistic in treating gut. And any questions? Yes, please, Anjali. Would you give the mic to her? Okay, there is a mic here. Okay. Any other audience questions? Please come up to the mic. An excellent discussion, and uh, we are so happy to have this topic here because all of us are learning about this topic. All of us. So I would like to put two points here. When it comes to uh, your gut brain axis uh, deciding the disease, or maybe what I would say is how you are deciding what disease you will get, mm. and what disease you get will also decide how you behave. That's right. Uh, in a it's, it's bidirectional. Right. Yeah. So when specifically it comes to the food prescription, or maybe diet prescription, what they say is that one is that you mentioned that there is a gut feel. So we need to uh, try to understand or make the patient try to understand his or her own gut feeling regarding the diet choices. Now this would be very good in health, but when it comes to disease and the patient has insulin resistance, the hunger is excessive and the patient tends to eat more, then uh, we cannot believe in that gut feel. So That's right. I think when it comes to prescribing the diet, uh, I often get confused whether I should respect the patient's uh, gut feeling, behaviors, oh. like small frequent meals or intermittent fasting or long, long time fasting, whether I should have my norms uh, of what I prescribe or should I give the respect to the patient's own gut feeling of what he would like to. I know it's a very vague uh, Right now we don't no, I think it's a very relevant question for all of us in practice. Would you like to take it? Any one of you? Yeah, Arundhati. So I think uh, we'll have to have the guts to <laughs> not take the patient's gut feeling and allow our gut feeling to come in action. <laughs> so, but yes, but of course, I mean, I agree with you. We cannot always go with the patient's gut feeling because more often than not, that is what has landed him in this position with obesity and dyslipidemia and all. So, uh, 
Yes, we, with whatever knowledge about uh, diet and its effect that we have, at the, we'll of course have to put that in place. But at the same time, I'll tell you something that, you know, I come from the East, where most people believe that the treatment is done only down south. So they come down to Chennai. So they come and show, and then they get a prescription made of the diet, which has nothing to do with what they eat. So they go back with the diet, one month they're having a lot of those things, and after one month they're like, they don't know what to do, because it's, that's not how they've grown up. So that is why when we're deciding on a diet, we will definitely need to keep our scientific you know, data at the back of our mind, but at the same time make it a little coordinated for the patient, so that it's not too difficult for him. Just one small question, one more if I can. Yeah. Uh, when we are accessing the brain axis in management of diabetes, do you find a good role of uh, drugs like SSRI inhibitors? Yes, which yes. Which can actually bring down the HPLC without even changing the anti-diabetes medications? Yeah, that's exactly what we are trying to portray. That uh, gut-brain axis, what you said initially was very right, that the patient's gut-brain axis is gone for a toss because of disease. So you try to get it into normalcy through use of SSRI, probiotics, right food habits, and uh, each patient will tell you, mala he I feel bad when I eat this or I feel good when I eat this. I think it is personalization and individualization of food. Secondly, importance of our natural probiotics. You see a list of natural probiotics and uh, I had forwarded the articles on berries. Berries are very good as probiotics. So uh, having berries, lime juice uh, in day-to-day -day food habits is a very, and tak, that uh, dahi chanj. This is a very good habit and I think the generation currently, why we are seeing rise in NCD is because we are seeing that shift of food habits and we are seeing that they are eating wrong foods and that's why getting diseases more frequently. So anything Minal Madam wants to add? Yeah. Anjali, yeah, this is what I was just trying to add on. You are very right that the patients come to you with a very different expectation. They come to you with a miraculous expectation that their food will not be stopped. They will not be asked to change their lifestyle and start walking. And Miraculously, somehow, their uh, parameters, the vital parameters, including HbA1c and lipid profile, will be normal, normalized by, because you are a doctor. They have come to you with that expectation. So we can't actually do that. The only thing is the microbiota, as we are talking here of gut-brain access, we need to emphasize a healthy diet and give them a little time, because it will take some time for the healthy microbiomes to start flour flourishing and growing in the uh, gut. And once the patient is tuned and the microbiota has flour, uh, actually cultured in the, inside the gut, that the patient starts, his choices gets deviated towards the healthy food choices eventually. T till that time, we'll have to force, maybe out of uh, pressure, that the patient has to be on a healthy diet. And as ma'am is saying, the lactobacillus that we have been studying, other than lactobacillus, the other most favorite friendly bacteria or the microbiota is the bifidobacter. So these two bacteria or the microbiota, we need to give them time to grow. Once they are grown in the gut, the food choices will automatically uh, switch back towards the healthy food choices. So I think it was a wonderful discussion, good interaction. Do we have a time for one more question, sir? Has one. Two more questions. Okay. Yeah. We teach about the wonderful statement which we all agree. The role of you said about the diet in South India, the role of traditional and fermented food. It's very good. There is a term called prebiotic and there's a term called probiotics. So when we talk of fermented food, there is no probiotic there. There are prebiotics there. So the difference is that when we talk of prebiotic, it is a non-living thing that helps the growth of positive microbiomes. Whereas when we introduce probiotics, there we already have the living microbiomes which are introduced into the system. So the fermented food which we are uh, supporting, the South Indian food specifically, even we are using in North, okay. Indi North India also, yes, we are consuming your, uh, the so-called South Indian food, of course. But yes, the South Indian food has the uh, edge that it is fermented. And the fermented food has an edge over the microbiomes because it is a form, not exactly, but it is a form of prebiotic. Just right. See, the pill is for diabetes. The, uh, the diabetes is not the entire, that is not the entire, exclusively diabetes. The other thing is diabetes, diarrhea. That's also unique.
short chain fatty acids. I don't know whether anyone knows the short. The short chain fatty acids again. So, again. That is also important yes. to discuss. So uh, how does this? I I, I think this is a topic for your lunch session with sir. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So I think that was a wonderful interaction, discussion on disbiases and symbiosis. So I think that was uh, wonderful and thanks for the interaction. Thank you so much. And